All right, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> We're looking at the, four, uh, the fifth church, the church of Thyatira, uh, the last fifth, no, fourth church, Thyatira. We've looked at Ephesus, and we've seen these are all historical churches, um, but they also have, uh, they represent a certain period of the church age down through the ages. Uh, they also speak to each one of us as individuals. So the Lord picked these seven on purpose. As we'll see, um, well, as we've seen with Ephesus, even their names are very important. Uh, Ephesus means desired ones, and we saw that Jesus was desiring their first love. Getting back to that first love relationship, back to that honeymoon type of relationship when they first got saved. Uh, even towards the end of the first century, the church was starting to wane in its love towards Jesus. So he desired them to come back to that intimacy with him. The church of Smyrna, their name comes from myrrh, and they represent the persecuted church from 64 AD to 313 A.D., six million Christians were martyred for their faith in Christ. Smyrna, the, the name comes from myrrh. Myrrh was their chief export. Myrrh is a fragrance that's produced when you take this certain plant and you crush it and grind it up, and then it produces this beautiful aroma, and that represents that persecuted church. We saw last time the church of Pergamos. The third one, it means um, bad marriage or a marriage that was not right. Um, it's because in, starting in 313 A.D. to about 500 A.D., this is when the church was married to the government. This is when Constantine made the church the official religion of the Roman Empire. So it became thoroughly married to the Roman system. And it wasn't a good thing. Jesus had some harsh things to say. So this morning we look at Thyatira. Thyatira means perpetual or continual sacrifice. And we're going to see this represents the dark ages of the church from 500 to 1500 and beyond because beginning with this church and the last four churches, Jesus speaks of the end times. He speaks of the great tribulation, the rapture, and the second coming in these various letters to these last four churches. So um, very important and very uh, interesting things that we're looking at here. These were actual churches in the first century that he writes to, but he's also writing to them because of their ongoing significance through church history. Adrian Rogers, some of you remember Adrian Rogers, great Bible teacher. He taught for over 40 years. I think he was in Tennessee, if I remember right. But he once said, it is better to be divided by truth than to be united by error. And as we'll see, that was the biggest problem with the church of Thyatira. And we'll see that this morning. They had embraced false doctrines, therefore they were united in their error. In fact, the church of Thyatira was tolerating this woman, and she's mentioned, her name is Jezebel, and they were tolerating her false doctrines, her false teachings. She was leading them astray into sexual immorality, idolatry, this also means this church lacked biblical discernment because they followed after these false teachings that were brought into the church. Um, it led to all kinds of wickedness and corruption. Again, this is the smallest church of the seven cities that Jesus writes to. And we also know that he writes more uh, verses to this church than any of the other churches. Another significant thing about this letter is that Jesus will mention the Great Tribulation and His coming for the first time. So we'll look at that in a moment as well. And the bottom line is, is you know, we need to make sure that we're following the Word of God and not following after all the extra biblical teachings that are all around us. Much of the truth of the Word of God is found in this church system that we're going to look at this morning. But it's overwhelmed with all these extra biblical teachings that are not scriptural that were added to this church system that has overwhelmed them. The good is still there, but uh, the problem is it gets buried all the, underneath all the unbiblical teachings. Now, uh, the, the city of Thyatira was located halfway between Pergamos and Sardis. And um, we're going to see that they were known for their business. They were known for their trade. 
Um, we don't know how the church started. We know that in Acts 16, there was Paul was there with uh, Silas and Timothy and, and Luke, and they were by the river there in uh, Philippi, 200 miles away. And there was a woman named Lydia from Thyatira. And she says she was a seller of purple. She was a wealthy woman. She takes them into her home there in Philippi. So she was very wealthy to be a seller of purple, not purple fabrics, but purple. It was a dye, very, very expensive. Uh, some of you have heard how they made the dye. They would take, um, it was a sea snail called a murex snail. And they would uh, squeeze one drop of this dye from each of the snails and it took thousands of snails to make enough dye to you know get purple fabric so that you can make very very expensive clothes and robes it was the royal color of the roman empire uh, jesus when they were mocking him they put a purple robe on him very expensive uh, so she was a wealthy woman she gets saved she ministers to Paul and Silas and the rest of them. But again, the city was known for their many trades, their guilds, their unions. They had idols to everything. And so if you worked as a leather worker, you would have an a idol for leather. You know? And so you'd give a pinch of incense on this altar. You'd often say, Caesar is Lord, and then you'd go to work. And this was very common in the Roman Empire. They had different idols for everything. The big one there in, in uh, Thyatira was called Sympathy or Sympathy, and she was this pagan alt, uh, idol that they would sacrifice continuously to, thus the name Thyatira means continual, perpetual sacrifice. So they always had incense burning before this uh, pagan altar. We're going to see why this corrupted the church as well. Chronologically, Thyatira re represents the Dark Ages, as I mentioned earlier, from about 500 to 1500 A.D., and we'll see why this is called the Dark Ages in a moment. But look at chapter 2, verse 18. He says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, and we've seen the word angel means messenger, it's also a word, angelos, that's mentioned of John the Baptist. He was called an angelos or messenger for Jesus Christ, the forerunner. So I believe they're writing to, Jesus is writing to these church leaders. Angels don't need messages. They don't need letters. They don't get postcards. Uh, they stand before the Lord. So Jesus is telling this leader of the church in Thyatira, these things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. So again, he introduces himself with one of the descriptive terms from chapter 1. Uh, here, though, he says the Son of God. This is the only mention of this by Jesus to these churches. He's calling himself the Son of God. Usually when he introduces himself, he'll call himself the Son of Man. In other words, he was fully man, but he's also fully God. When he came from heaven to earth, he was God who came from heaven to earth. He became fully human. So he understands exactly what we're going through. He was tempted like we're tempted, yet without sin. He was hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He experienced life like we do, yet without sin. Remember what it says there in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So we must never forget that Jesus is fully human, but he's fully God. He came from heaven to earth. He was God in eternity past. He's always had that relationship with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. He is the creator and sustainer of life. He is the one who has sovereign right to rule and reign over the entire universe. He also mentions here in verse 18, he, has, he says he has eyes like a flame of fire. That was given to us in chapter 1, verse 14, where the Apostle John turns around to see this voice that was speaking to him, and he sees him, and one of the descriptive terms was, I saw him his eyes like a flame of fire. This speaks of Jesus' penetrating gaze upon those in this church. Uh, Jesus sees through the outward appearance, 
And any of you that walk around, you put on a happy face, you get this veneer over your life, he sees right through that. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you can't fool God anytime. Jesus sees our hearts. He knows exactly what's inside of us. Greater than Superman, Jesus has x-ray vision. He sees, he knows. This is why a lot of people start feeling very uneasy when they go to a Bible teaching church. They feel like the eyes of Jesus are upon them. Again, he knows all, he sees all. And sometimes that makes people very uncomfortable. Before I got saved, I was at San Diego State and I was uh, interested in this girl. She was a Christian and she goes, I'll only date Christians. Oh, I'm a Christian. No, I wasn't. I was anything but a Christian, but she says, okay, come to church with me. And I said, okay. So I go into this church, and it was a great church back then. I can't remember. Uh, well, it was a College Avenue Baptist church. I hope it's still a good church. So I'm sitting there, and literally in the middle of this message, I don't even know what the guy was saying. The pastor was teaching. I started shaking. I started sweating. I mean, I was getting so upset. It was weird. I can't explain it. It was a spiritual battle going on. I literally got up and ran out of the church. And I had some excuse like, oh, you know, I just wasn't feeling well. No, I felt like this heavy-duty conviction on me. I thought Jesus was condemning me. I thought Jesus wanted to rake me over the coals. I didn't realize, no, it was the enemy that was wanting to condemn me. Jesus was bringing conviction that I was a sinner and I needed to get saved. And so the enemy twists that, as he often does in spiritual battle, and we start thinking, oh, God must really hate me. Long story short, uh, she dropped me like a... Whatever. You know, it was a good thing she dropped me because I was not a good person and I, I was wicked. So I got saved about a year later. But I didn't realize Jesus exposed these things in my heart because he wanted me to confess. He wanted me to repent. He wanted me to come, come clean, you know, get right with the Lord, get saved, be forgiven. So he has eyes like a flame of fire. Anyway, Jesus says here that his feet are like fine brass. Brass is a picture of judgment. In the Old Testament, there was the brass laver or bowl. The priest would wash their hands before the sacrifice. They would put the sacrifice on the brass altar. It was a judgment for our sins, whatever animal they laid upon that brass. It was the way that the Lord would allow the people to get close to him because their sins needed to be dealt with, to be in fellowship with him. So here's Jesus, feet like fine brass, standing in the midst of this church, which means he's ready to judge them unless they repent. That's always his desire. He wants you to get right with him. He wants you to repent if you need to. He doesn't want you playing games with him. Jesus is not here this morning to judge and condemn, but to heal and restore. He didn't come from heaven to earth to condemn us. You know the famous verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. Well, it's the very next verse. Jesus says, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He's here to bring conviction of our sins uh, into our lives so that we will humble ourselves before Him. At the same time, if you continue to reject His goodness and grace and mercy, because he is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, eventually, without Christ, you will meet him as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, and he will sentence you to the lake of fire. John 3.36 summarizes it like this, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So without Christ... You, you feel this cloud of judgment, condemnation, you know, wrath hanging over you. It's true. It is there. But Jesus is saying, come to me and I'll remove that. You don't need to walk under this cloud of condemnation. I came to bring conviction of sin so you can be set free. So he comes this way to this church of Thyatira. But even in a church like this, that's really going downhill fast, he finds something good to say about them. Unlike me and some of you, I'm sure, we like to look for the bad and people first instead of seeing something good. So this is what the Lord says in verse 19. I know your works, love, 
service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So he's got some good things to say here. He says, I know your works. I know your love. The, the Greek word is agape. This group, they're walking in God's love. They have love for God. They have love for others. He says he knows their service. Diakonia, the Greek word, which means deacon. That's where we get the term for deacon. So they were a very service-oriented group. They had serving hearts, helping hands, you might say. Jesus says they have faith. Hebrews 11.6, we're told, but without faith it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So they have faith. He also mentions patience. This is perseverance under pressure. This church has this. At the end of verse 19, Jesus says their works are increasing. Now that's always a good thing. Their works are increasing. This church and this system that we'll talk about has done a lot of good things over the years. Many hospitals have been built by this group, even the big one here in Grand Junction. They've built many orphanages. They've built many universities, schools. The sad thing is, in spite of all the good things this church was doing, it does not make up for what Jesus was going to call them out for and the bad things that he says against them. In other words, even though this church was active in good works, they were not active in holding fast to God's word. Good works apart from God's word is basically humanism. Humanism, here's a definition of humanism, an outlook or system of thought attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. In other words, it stresses the goodness of human beings over the righteousness of God, and that's not a good thing. That, that becomes the heart of atheism. So Jesus says in verse 20, Nevertheless, right after saying these good things, he says, nevertheless, you don't want to hear this from Jesus in your heart. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. So there was something within this church and during this time frame that Jesus could not tolerate. They allowed this woman Jezebel to bring in false doctrines, false teachings, wicked doctrines into this church. It was a doctrine that seduced God's people, Jesus' servants, to commit, he says, your sexual immorality, to, to get involved in idolatry. People always want to know, was this a real woman in the church? Yeah. Was her name Jezebel? Possibly. I mean, I can't imagine any of you naming your kids Jezebel or Judas Iscariot. Good names, but yeah, they kind of got tainted, right? So here, more likely, this is a false woman, this false prophet within the church that functioned in the wicked spirit of Jezebel, and the wicked spirit of Jezebel refers to an evil, deceitful spirit. Many of you know Queen Jezebel. She's infamous in First and Second Kings. She was a Gentile queen of Israel. She was a Sidonian. And she married the wicked, very wicked, King Ahab, the king of Israel. And she introduced Baal worship to the Israelites. And she didn't stop... Um, worship of the one true God, Yahweh, but she said, oh, you can still worship Yahweh, Jehovah, but let's bring in all these other things we can worship. And Ahab went along with it, and it became very corrupt. What's the very first commandment say in Exodus 20? You shall have no other gods before me or alongside of me. But that's exactly what she did. She brought in Baal worship alongside of, you know, Ashtoreth, alongside of um, Molech, alongside of Jehovah. So it all became this big soup of anything goes. The God of Israel was no longer worshipped exclusively. 
but he simply became a figurehead, another idol, but Baal worship became number one at this time in Israel. As I said earlier, the truth is in there. The truth was there in Israel, but it was being overwhelmed by all these other things. The other things are the problem. When churches start bringing in, inviting all these false teachings, extra biblical doctrines, all these other things that you don't find in the Word of God, it gets very confusing very quickly. And people can start getting caught up in all these false teachings that are not biblical, and pretty soon their minds are drifting towards all this other stuff. It's kind of like ice cream. I love ice cream. But if somebody says, here, have this bowl of ice cream. Oh, that looks great. And you start eating it, and then they say, Oh, there happens to be some glass shards in there. Well, pff, wait a minute. You know, yeah, there's some metal, you know, pieces in there. You're not going to want to sift through that. And like, eh, okay, I'm going to pull out that piece of metal, that piece of glass. No, you're just going to throw it out. You're going to spit it out. Well, that's how it was in this church system. As you know, this culminated with the 450 prophets of Baal against one prophet of God, Elijah. Uh, when we go to Israel, we always go to Mount Carmel. That's where that big event took place where God, you know, proved himself that he's the one true God. And Elijah ends up killing all 450 false prophets of Baal. It was a great showdown. And the one true living God proved that Baal was nothing but a man-made God who was worthless, who was unworthy to be worshipped. But the problem is by that time... Baal worship had already infiltrated all of northern, you know, the ten tribes. Baal worship became the, the reason why God would eventually wipe out the ten northern tribes, scatter them under the Assyrians, but it did horrible things to the nation of Israel. There are basically three ways that the spirit of Jezebel has functioned within the church. The first one is seen in this first century church of Thyatira, you know, again, she brought false doctrines into this church, pagan practices. She's corrupting it from the inside out. Again, Jesus is acknowledged there in this church, but their practice had no scriptural basis. How did she do this? Well, notice what Jesus says here. She calls herself a prophetess. Jesus didn't say, you're my prophet, you're my prophetess to this church. No, she appointed herself as a prophetess. He didn't call her a spokesman for God. In verse 24, Jesus says that she is actually teaching the deep things of Satan and not the deep things of God. In other words, introducing new things into the church that are not biblical, that are not scripturally based, is actually one of Satan's main tricks when it comes to ruining churches, the emphasis gets played, uh, you know, the emphasis gets placed on these false teachings and following these rules and rituals and regulations rather than staying focused on the Word of God. The second way the spirit of Jezebel has functioned within the church is in the historical church that represented, that's represented by Thyatira, again, from 500 AD to 1500 AD. It's known as the Dark Ages for a reason. This is when the church became the state church or the Church of Rome. This is when the Catholic Church took precedence over everything else. And many self-proclaimed prophets of God introduced many pagan practices and doctrines that have no foundation in God's Word. Who are these self-appointed prophets? They were the popes, the popes of the Roman Church. They started bringing in or introducing so many things that were contrary to the Word of God. It was during this time, and I'll go through a list here, and this is just a very abbreviated list of things that were brought into the church during the Dark Ages. One of the things brought in was the doctrine of purgatory, where you don't go to you know, heaven or hell when you die. You go to this intermediate state known as purgatory, and you'd stay there for an indefinite amount of time depending how sinful you were before you went there. And you'd have to stay there until all your sins were burned up, and then you could maybe go to heaven. No guarantees, by the way. There was no assurance of salvation. It was during this time in 600 AD that Latin became the only language that you could use in the church. 
So the priest would speak in Latin. All the people would hear the messages in Latin. That was the official statement of the church dogma until 1967. For a long time, over 1,000 or 1,300 years, Latin was the only thing spoken in the Catholic Church. Also during this time, it was when prayers started shifting away from the Lord and prayers were offered up to Mary and to the saints and even to angels. Mary worship. Mary became co-redemptrix with Jesus for your salvation. Jesus too busy, so we'll go to his mom because she's perfect. No, she's not. It, it, what's called the Magnificat in Luke chapter 2 that's where Mary is singing, you know, because the angel now she's going to be pregnant. And she cries out to God, my Savior. Well, who needs a Savior? Sinners. She knew she wasn't perfect. And so they said, oh, she's a perpetual virgin. No. We're told in Mark's gospel and Luke's gospel that she had other children. Names four boys and at least two girls that were by Joseph and her. So this takes place in the church. In 610 A.D., this is when the title Pope or Vicar of Christ came to be used. It wasn't used before then, but the title Vicar of Christ means he is the substitute for Jesus on earth. So whatever he says goes. They claim to be the spokesman for Jesus. We just had Bill McKeever here this summer, and he spends most of his time studying Mormonism, and he's from the Mormonism Research Ministries. And one of the things we learn is that when you have a new prophet in Mormonism, whatever he says takes precedence over whatever any other prophet said in the Mormon church. So they can contradict what Joseph Smith said or Brigham Young because their God is evolving. He gets new information. And so whatever he says goes. The same with the popes. If a pope says something, whoa, this pope said something just the opposite. doesn't matter because this pope takes precedence. In 786 A.D., worship of relics and idols and images and the cross became official. Why is there so much emphasis on things like, oh, you can go to some museums. They have a piece of the cross, they say, of Jesus, and they worship these things. Oh, we have a piece of the Shroud of Turin. Whether it is or not, they worship these things. It became official dogma to the church that you can worship these things in 786. 1079 A.D., this is when all priests were required to become celibate. Wow, I'd hate to be a priest at that time. That hasn't worked out so well. It's caused a lot of sexual immorality in the church. We're seeing all kinds of repercussions because the Catholic Church said, you can't marry. God said, it's not good for men to be alone, Genesis 2.18. And yet they come against that and say, no, no, if you're going to be a Catholic priest, you must be celibate. In 1090 A.D., this is when the rosary and prayer beads became official doctrine and practice. 1184 A.D., the Inquisition was instituted by the Council of Veronica, whereby Christians would be put to death if they disagreed with any of these things up to this point. The Inquisition. Hundreds of thousands of Christians were put to death because they say, no, we're not going to go this direction. We're going to follow what the Bible says. 1190 A.D., the sale of indulgences where you could pay your way out of purgatory. That became convenient. This is the number one reason why the Catholic Church was and still is one of the richest entities in the world. At that time, it became the richest entity in the world because the more money you had, you'd give whatever, equivalent to $100,000 to the priest or pope. That means it cuts time out of purgatory. And they sold indulgences. The poor people, they couldn't pay for it, so they fear, feared we're going to be there in a long time. But if you're wealthy, you'd give more money to the church, and then you'd spend less time in purgatory. That's not biblical. Come on. 1215, the doctrine of transubstantiation became official where, like we took communion today, the cracker, the juice represents the body and blood of Christ. Transubstantiation is, no, this wafer is the literal body of Jesus. This cup we're all going to drink from This is the literal blood of Jesus. If you spilled it, you could be put to death back then. I mean, it was brutal. That's not a biblical doctrine. Jesus says, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Thyatira means perpetual sacrifice. This is why during the Mass, Jesus is re-crucified every Mass. 
This is why they have a crucifix with Jesus hanging on the cross. He's not on the cross anymore. He's seated at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us. And yet during Mass, he's re-crucified the literal body and blood once again that only the Catholic priest can turn into Jesus. That is not biblical. 1229, the Council of Valencia. This placed the Bible on the no-read list. In other words, nobody could read the Bible, nobody could own a Bible except for the Catholic priest. Only he could tell you what it says and what it means. If you were caught with any you know, part of the scriptures, you could be put to death. That was not good. <laughs> Does any of these doctrines come from the Word of God? Absolutely not. They became the church dogma at this time. And, and again, that's just a very surface reading of all these different things they implemented. The truth, still there, but it's been covered up by all this rubble of what the spirit of Jezebel has brought into the church. There's a third way the spirit of Jezebel works today, and it's not just in that church, it's in many churches where they will take in so-called prophets and apostles today saying, we have a word from the Lord for you, for your church. I've had so many people, mostly men, come to the church and say, I have a word from God for this church. I want to hear it first. After I hear it, it's like, no, you don't. <laughs> this is not from the Lord. This contradicts the word of God. You're not going to say anything here. I mean, it's a, it's a sad thing, but so many churches will take all these extra biblical things and say, yes, these are the, the deeper things of the Lord. And they'll tell you that you don't have these extra biblical things because you're not open to other things outside of Scripture. And it's like, you're right, we are not. There was a split in Calvary Chapel back in 1980, and it was over one simple thing where this guy said, I don't think the, the Holy Spirit is limited to the Bible. Pastor Chuck says, no, the Holy Spirit works within the parameters of the Bible. And that was it. So this group left in 1980 because the Holy Spirit, you can't limit him to the Word of God. Yes, you do. If the Holy Spirit doesn't work outside the parameters of God's Word, otherwise you can have anything goes. Any weird thing, you can say, oh, that's the Holy Spirit. I can say whatever I want because I'm speaking for the Holy Spirit. Be careful. That is against the Word of God. Jesus tells us, Paul confirms, the writers of God's Word tell us over and over again things like this. Matthew 24, 35, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Jesus prayed to the Father in John 9, uh, 17, 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And on and on it goes. This is God's word. This is living. This is powerful. This is sharper than any two-edged sword. And I guarantee not one of us in here knows the Bible 100% from Genesis to Revelation, but this is God's word, period, from Genesis to Revelation. We see through a glass dimly now, but then face to face. Any questions you have about the Bible, God doesn't have any questions about it. Jesus knows it perfectly. And he knows exactly what every verse means. We might like, oh, I'm not sure about this. It'll all be figured out when we stand before Him in glory. But this is God's life-changing, life-sustaining Word to His people. So don't be moved from it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. But read it. Study it. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your hearts and minds as you spend time in God's glorious Word. Paul commended the Bereans in Acts 17 because they didn't just believe what the Apostle Paul said. Remember, he says the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians because they took the word of God that Paul shared with them and they examined it daily. They searched the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was right. Paul wasn't offended by that. Paul commended them because they were so diligent to be in the word of God. 
the spirit of Jezebel. It's still very much at work in the world around us. So we need to stand upon the truth of God's word like never before, because the Bible is also very clear that in these last days there's going to be many lying signs and wonders, and false teachers will be on the increase. So I exhort you, continue to grow in your relationship with the Lord that's based on growing in your understanding of God's word. So notice what Jesus says and then does with those who continue to hold to the spirit of Jezebel. Verse 21, And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Even with this so-called uh, prophetess, Jezebel, Jesus is patient. He gives her time to repent, which means Jesus waited patiently for her, which means the Holy Spirit had been bringing conviction of sin into her life, but she refused to repent. She hardened her heart. How sad, what a tragedy that is, and it's always hard when I see people digging in their heels when I know the Lord's calling them to repentance. The Lord is saying, you need to turn from this sin that is holding on to your heart. And they say, no, I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to do things this way. And it's just a lack of humility. It's a refusal to humble yourself before the Lord and say, God, you're right. I'm wrong. Your word is true. And there's so many that are still walking under the deceitful spirit of Jezebel. Because when I see someone say things like, you know what, I'm going to live this kind of lifestyle, and I don't care what God's word says, that's the spirit of Jezebel. When someone says, I can believe whatever I want about Jesus, and everybody goes to heaven, that's the spirit of Jezebel. I can practice these sinful things. Who are you to judge me? I'm not, but what does God's word say? If they believe these things that are contrary to the scriptures, that's the spirit of Jezebel. How many of you, this is going to date me, how many of you remember Ann Landers? <laughs> Ann Landers, for 47 years, she wrote an advice column. It was in 1,200 newspapers throughout the United States. That was her pen name, Ann Landers. I can't remember now what it, her real name was, but... Um, you know, it was always starting off the letter, be dear Anne, and then they'd give you whatever their advice they're thinking or whatever advice they need. And then they'd always sign it like, you know, troubled or hurting or confused. And then she'd always write back, dear confused, and then give the answer. Well, she died in 2002. One of the last things she, one of the last advice columns she wrote, this is what it says. Dear Anne, I'm sleeping with two women right now. But they don't know each other, but they recently accidentally met. Now they are both furious at me. What shall I do? And please don't give me that moral junk, signed, trapped. So here's Anne's response. Dear trapped, the one major thing that separates human beings from animals is a soul and a God-given sense of morality. But since you reject that, I strongly suggest that you consult a veterinarian. <laughs> Good advice. Good advice. God's word is the final authority. Now, again, the heart of Jesus and the desire of Jesus for people to humble themselves before the Lord, turn away from their destructive things, that's simply what repentance is. You turn away from these things that you know are wrong, start doing things his way. You allow Jesus to cleanse your heart, renew your mind, refresh your soul. Proverbs 6.16 says, we're, we're told something that we need to be very careful with, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans. Sounds like our government today. Feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. And one who sows discord among the brethren. So again, if any of these things are embedded in your heart, Jesus is giving you time to repent. 
He does not want to see you self-destruct in sin, but he wants to forgive you. He wants to restore you. He wants to, like David says, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness or slowness, but is long-suffering or patient toward us, not willing or desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so the choice is ours. You know, Jesus won't force anybody to live for him or walk with him, but his heart's desire is to see us humble ourselves before him and, and recognize he does love us unconditionally his grace is sufficient he has the best plan for our lives he wants us to walk in freedom to have victory he doesn't want us to be caught up in all these things that tear our hearts away from the lord at the same time if we continue to ignore him we reject him we reject his grace and mercy and forgiveness. The same Jesus who is so willing to forgive and restore is also the one who will judge and rebuke. Look at verse 22. He says, first he gave her time to repent. She did not. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. So notice that Jesus rebukes not only the woman Jezebel, but her followers, her offspring. He mentions sexual immorality, idolatry, adultery. This speaks of both physical adultery and spiritual adultery. In other words, when the people of Thyatira worshipped and honored other gods besides the one true living God, they were worshipping idols. They were committing sexual sin, spiritually speaking. We see this throughout the Old Testament, where God would come against his people because they were entering into sexual immorality spiritually. This is what we read in Jeremiah chapter 3, starting in verse 8. God tells Jeremiah, Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but went and played the harlot also. So it came to pass, through her casual harlotry, that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones and trees. In other words, she's worshiping carved images. Yet for all this, her treacherous sister Judah has not turned to me with her whole heart, but in pretense, says the Lord. In other words, they're just going through the motions. They weren't serious about their walk with God. We see the same thing with this church system in Thyatira. He says they played the harlot, they go from a bed of sin, and they end up in a sick bed. That's true for all sexual sin and rebellion against the Lord. There are always consequences to our actions. We can think, oh, I got away with it. God must not care. I wasn't judged yesterday for what I just did. God is patient. He gives you time to repent. So don't think that because you got away with it in your mind, you're not going to face consequences. The good news is there's always hope. Jesus can take whatever ugly wicked, sinful thing we've been involved with. He can bring healing. He can bring forgiveness. He can restore what has been destroyed, what the locusts have devoured. Remember the prodigal son? He wasted all of his father's inheritance on wine, women, and, you know, sinful life. He finds himself in the pig pen wrestling the, you know, swine for the carob pods. And then it says he came to his senses and he realized, even my father's servants have it better than this. Luke chapter 15. If I humble myself and go back to my father, maybe he'll take me back as one of his servants. Well, you know the story. He's walking home. He's all probably stinky and nasty looking. And he's just, you know, probably like, oh, I just hope my dad will take me back as one of his servants. No, the father sees his son, runs out to him, throws his arms around him, puts his cloak on him, gives him the ring off his finger, slaughters a fatted calf. My son who was lost has been found. 
That's the heart of the Father. He's not there to beat you up, to beat you down. He's the here to restore, to refresh, to heal. But unless there's genuine repentance, this church system, Jesus says, will be cast into the Great Tribulation. Starting in chapter 6 through chapter 18, book of Revelation, that is the Great Tribulation. Unless there's a true repentance, a true acknowledgement of who Jesus Christ is, all the make-believers, and there's going to be people from every church, now it's not just the Catholic Church. I'll talk about this next week. Hopefully when the rapture takes place, nobody in here is going to show up the next Sunday. Wouldn't that be weird? Show up and you're the only one here, or there's a handful of people? That would be sad. But the Great Tribulation, as he says here, I am he who searches the minds and hearts. Jesus knows those who are genuine believers in him and those who are simply make-believers. So look at verse 24. He says, Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, they're born-again Catholics. I've known some. I'm sure you've known people. My wife was born and raised in the Catholic Church, and she knew a lot of her friends. They loved Jesus. When she moved from Virginia, where they were actually worshiping the one true living God, then she moved to San Diego, the church she went to there. She goes, man, I've never seen so much idolatry. I couldn't believe the things they were doing. Mary worship. Because that wasn't part of, that wasn't part of our Catholic Church back there. But unfortunately, it was part of that in San Diego. So there's people in all these different systems that are true Christians. And Jesus says, this is what I'm saying to you. You've not known the depths of Satan, as they say. I will put on you no other burden, but hold fast to what you have till I come. That's a, a, something we all need to remember. Before Christ comes for his bride, we need to hold fast to his word. We're coming back with him, Revelation 19, at the second coming, but we're going to go to be with him at the rapture of the church. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, For the Lord himself, there it is, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, all those who've died over the last 2,000 years in Christ, then Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So this wonderful exhortation for all of us is hang on tight, hold fast, don't let your faith go, and hold on to Jesus. Don't give in to the lies of the enemy. Notice he says here, I will put on you no other burden. The burdens of religion are heavy. The burdens of all these rules, rituals, and regulations that churches come up with, it just bogs you down. It brings in confusion. Jesus tells us, Matthew eleven twenty eight to 30, just the opposite. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. We just need to keep holding fast to the promises of God's word, keep growing in our relationship with Jesus, keep sharing the good news with others till he takes us home to be with him. Let's wrap it up, verse 26, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. My works? I thought we were saved by grace, apart from works. What, is, what does it mean, my works? Remember in um, it was it John 6, 29, they come to Jesus. Teacher, what must we do to work the works of God? And he says, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom the Father has sent. So it's, that's my works when he says my work is faith. Keep believing. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep your faith in Jesus Christ alone. That's what he refers to, keeps my works until the end. Believe, walk in faith. Paul says at the end of his life, I've kept the faith. I'm running the race. I haven't denied the Lord's name. And, and he's going to be with him in glory. 
So he keeps my works to the end. To him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessels. We'll talk more about this in chapter 20. During the millennial reign of Christ, we're going to rule and reign with the Lord at that time. As I also have received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. Who's the morning star? That's found in Revelation 22, verse 16. Jesus is called the bright and morning star. In other words, our ultimate reward is Jesus himself. He is our ultimate prize. To know him, to be immersed in him. So don't take your focus off of him. Don't be deceived by the spirit of Jezebel. Don't let anything or anyone move you away from Jesus. Hold fast till he comes. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches.